<laughs> at this this August was my golden anniversary of my professional life. Fifty really? years. Wow. <laughs> And when we started, as you may know, we had to build our own computers, and it wasn't a viable that's right. procedure then. We just didn't have the computing power. But that's when research was fun, you know, Absolutely. electromechanical relays. Okay, but let's talk about what's going on now. And, uh, I was invited to uh, chat about my book uh, and the uh, whole concept of adding neurotherapy to your practice. Uh, and the neurotherapy we're going to be talking about, uh, I have a little bit of a different take on a lot of these things in terms of uh, what makes for a good neurotherapy practice. And my basic premise is that neurotherapy is not a standalone discipline. You add it to something, you bring something else to the table. And the nice thing about the kind of procedure that uh, I use is it marries perfectly with any other therapeutic discipline or metaphor. And we'll be chatting a bit about that as we proceed. And the basis of my uh, system is the clinical queue. And it's based on a clinical database. And it is very simple procedure. And it is extremely accurate. <laughs> I don't ask people why they come to see me. I let the brain tell me. And these are a couple of quotes from a book written by Susan Olding on pathologies, as it's called. <clears throat> this is giving her tale of woe about what she had to do to get adequate care for her challenged child. And there's a chapter in there on my intake assessment. And these are a couple of the quotes from it. To see the first one, she tried to give me a lot of the history of the child, and I waved it away without even looking at it. So I make a big deal about not uh, look, uh, not uh, collecting information about the symptoms until I see what the brain has to tell me, and that's <laughs> contained in that second uh, excerpt there. Uh, you know, I just pointed at the outline of the brain and the numbers. These numbers imply trauma and so forth. And one by one, he read the ratios, divining my daughter more quickly, more accurately than any professional I'd yet encountered. That's six minutes of recording time <clears throat> and instant uh, feedback to the client. The intake assessment defines the first therapy session, as you'll see as we proceed. You don't need a lot of fancy equipment. Uh, you need a pencil of paper and a desktop calculator. That gives you away my age. And, uh, and a, a single uh, device, and you can see <clears throat> jotted down here 30 or 40 uh, different uh, items. And I said to this lady <clears throat> that uh, you're going through a severe emotional stressor. It looks like it's interpersonal in nature. You're uh, unhappy about it, and you're, you're uh, emotionally volatile. And she said, I'm going through a very nasty divorce. Okay, the brain told me all of that. Now, clinical psychoneurophysiology, neurotherapy, uh, is and relevant or it can approach and can be uh, useful for the treatment of a wide range of conditions, as we have some examples here. This doesn't mean that once you become a quote, neurotherapist that you should approach all of these. It all depends on what your fundamental basic training is. Are you a physician? Are you a chiropractor? Are you a psychologist, etc.? And you stay within your jurisdictional area of practice. That is what it is that you are trained to do. I feel very adamant about those sorts of things. <clears throat> The clinical cue forms the basis of everything. It's the initial brain assessment. And the two fundamental concepts, <coughs> excuse me, one is bottom up, and that is you collect the data, the brain tells you what the symptoms are, not the other way around. And the second issue, as I just mentioned before, it's not a standalone discipline. Neurofeedback or neurotherapy, not a standalone. <clears throat> you 
brings something else to the table. It marries with whatever your actual discipline is. And my system, I measure five spots on the head, one in the occipital region in the brain, and the reason it's O1 is because Gene Peniston started at O1 way, way, way back. <clears throat> CZ, or CZ as we say in Canada, and then right across the frontal cortex. <clears throat> Let me give you a couple of examples. This is a printout from the uh, Brain Driver uh, and Clinical Q Suite uh, put out by the Biofeedback Federation of Europe. And these are self ratings the person has <clears throat> anxiety, moody, depressed, rebellious. <clears throat> so, and, uh, it highlights in red uh, in this particular system, although you don't need the suite. You can do it with a pencil and paper. Uh, and we have a situation in which there's very poor stress tolerance <clears throat> because of deficiencies in the occipital region in the brain, O1, where we want those theta-beta ratios to be stronger. So yeah, there's the anxiety issue. And this is the frontal cortex, F3 and F4. So we have a marker for depression, we have a marker for, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, being rebellious, and we have a marker for moody. Okay, now this just gives you an idea of, of what <coughs> the brain can tell us uh, with just the measurement at those five locations <coughs> and the max recording time, if you're doing one site at a time, is about six minutes, and if you're doing all five at the same time, it's a couple of minutes. Okay, here's another example. <clears throat> this is the self-report from the client. He has problems falling asleep and staying asleep. Second, I get angry easily. And third, I have trouble concentrating and staying focused. Okay, here's what the data say. Theta beta ratio at CZ is high. There's your <coughs> attention issue, concentration issue. Uh, we also have elevated de uh, delta at FZ, FZ. Uh, likewise, <coughs> it's a problem with uh, sustaining focus and attention. And then we have situation of <coughs> uh, elevated alpha on the right prefrontal orbital cortex. <coughs> so. And there's your angry easily. Uh, and at the back of the brain, uh, here's the cardinal marker for a sleep disturbance where eyes closed, theta beta ratio is considerably less than eyes open. So and there's the kind of accurate uh, hit that we have. And let's see what happens if we send a full cue for a clinical report from one of the professional agencies that provide feedback. And if you look <clears throat> down at what they're recommending, it's not relevant to any one of the uh, issues that the client reported. So there's a huge, huge difference between a normative database, which is what this is based on, and a clinical database, which is what the clinical cue is based on, of course. So just some uh, summary uh, statements about the clinical cue. It's the initial intake instrument. And what I mean by that is it's not, you uh, do not administer a lot of uh, pencil and paper or, or uh, soft psych assessment uh, devices. You, you get the information from the brain, bottom up. Now, it structures the first therapy session. What I mean by that, it is very similar to cognitive behavior therapy because you're restructuring the way the person thinks about their problem. <clears throat> they start to define it in physiological terms so that <clears throat> they know that there's a reason or a representation of their condition in brain functioning. And secondarily, it tells, you, <clears throat> it tells them that you know where to go to fix it. Clinical cue is uh, doable with, in, uh, with infants, uh, uh, clients who are unavailable for a full cue, uh, severe autism, for example. Now, it's important to keep in mind this is not a mini cue. It is a clinical 
evaluative procedure and unique to itself. It's not a, uh, a mini full queue. <clears throat> and the other very important concept is it's not a party trick. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is individuals who are sitting in front of you have manifested conditions. <clears throat> the people who are not sitting in front of you, who are walking down the street outside your office, many of them have predispositions that haven't manifested. So <clears throat> it's not designed to sit a person down who's not announcing themselves or presenting themselves for treatment and tell that individual what kind of conditions they're experiencing because they may not be experiencing them. It may not have manifested. For, <clears throat> for conditions like traumatic brain injury, seizure disorders, and <clears throat> autism spectrum disorders, stroke, and so forth, we want to go to a full queue. We want to look at connectivity. <clears throat> now, I'm going to be going over some of the interpretive ranges <clears throat> of the clinical queue. And for folks who <clears throat> don't <clears throat> have uh, uh, information on my system, if you just email my office manager at swingleclinic.com, <clears throat> he'll fire a uh, basic interpretive uh, ranges uh, document back to you. <clears throat> so the clinical queue, what we're looking at, at CZ is we're looking at alpha, theta, beta, and sensory motor rhythm. Back of the brain, we're looking at theta, alpha, and beta. F3 and F4, theta, alpha, and beta. <clears throat> and at FZ, we're looking at, in addition to the regular ones we've just mentioned, we're looking at high beta gamma, <clears throat> which is 28 to 40 cycles a second. <clears throat> and we're looking at the high and low uh, alpha. Okay, again the five positions. Now the probes are very e easy. <clears throat> so if at CZ we see a theta beta ratio above 2.2 or under cognitive challenge above 2.2, uh, that's the uh, area of the cutoff where we start thinking about uh, common attention deficit disorder. <clears throat> Uh, a condition I'll show you in just a moment is where everything looks fine at rest, but it's only under cognitive challenge where you see the elevated theta-beta ratio. That's a particularly nasty form of ADD, by the way, <clears throat> which we'll get into later. So we have all of these probes associated with <clears throat> uh, data that's coming from the brain. Now, the way the clinical cue was formulated was we got a huge number of uh, patients. My database is over 1,500. And we looked at what conditions we find in the brain that are discriminative based on what a client has reported. That is the reason they came for treatment. I came to treatment for depression, OK? And what we do is determine using discriminative function statistical analyses what kind of configurations <clears throat> you find in the brain that are associated with these self-reported conditions. And at O1, the big issue there is the theta-beta ratio. And <clears throat> if it's too low, then the person has problems with stress tolerance, excuse me, uh, problems finding the switch to turn the brain off, sleep problems, and so forth. <coughs> uh, at the frontal cortex, the big issue there is balance. Uh, and we'll be going over uh, a number of the markers for depression, for example. And But in the... Uh, original was work done by Richie Davidson in terms of if alpha is uh, elevated in the left relative to the right, that's a marker for depression. And he showed that you could actually induce that by uh, having the individuals watch uh, uh, negative uh, or emotionally uh, negative films, for example, or reading texts that uh, uh, portrayed extremely sad uh, conditions, you would see an elevation in the uh, alpha in the left. Okay. And at FZ, 
we have a number of markers, uh, markers for pa passivity, markers for stubbornness, uh, uh, markers for brain efficiency. Now again, if you email my office manager, office manager at swingleclinic.com, <clears throat> they'll send you a handout that I use in my workshops that help you to interpret all of this. It's also in the book, of course. And the <clears throat> clinical cue and brain driver suite uh, gives you the values we've just been talking about, and it also tells the therapist what to probe. <clears throat> okay, now, obviously, my uh, uh, my adamant fundamental uh, issue here is the label is absolutely unimportant. It gives you absolutely no information. You want to treat the neurology, not the label. We use the labels to be able to communicate with our patients. It has nothing at all to do with how we're going to treat this. Now, obviously, my main issue here is that you use a clinical database that is people who are actually presenting themselves for treatment as opposed to a normative database. And in my judgment, normative databases are simply inappropriate for clinical settings. There are a few exceptions to that, things like connectivity. <clears throat> uh, but uh, the, as I showed you in one of the uh, first cases, that when you're using a clinical uh, normative database, <clears throat> that the uh, results uh, completely missed the uh, complaints uh, as uh, self-reported by the client, where the clinical base would bang on. Now, this is the principal reason why a clinical database <clears throat> is the one you want to use, and the normative database, the logic is just wrong. Take the example of identical twins. If one of them has manifested schizophrenia, what's the probability that the second identical twin will have manifested schizophrenia? Well, it's roughly 50%. The interesting statistic is 50% will not. And this, the uh, twin with schizophrenia ends up in my database and the, the twin with the pre same genetic predisposition load without manifested schizophrenia ends up in the normative database. And that's why the normative databases are blind, statistically blind, to a lot of clinical conditions. <clears throat> okay, let's go over a couple of cases here. These are the diagnostic criteria for ADHD. <clears throat> this comes from DSM-4, not the 5, <clears throat> but the 5 is very similar to this. So six or more of the following for at least six months, <clears throat> and you can uh, hang up the label of ADHD. What if you have three? Uh, the criteria for the hyperactive, uh, you need six or more of all of these for at least six months. Okay. What if you've had them for three months? What if you only have two? The whole thing is just silly. And I love this. Runs, climbs excessively. Okay. <laughs> uh, in the DSM-5, they changed that to <laughs> inappropriately. <laughs> okay. This comes from uh, Siegfried uh, Othmer. <clears throat> just showing one form of an ADD hyperactive kid. And you can see the difference here. The low frequency amplitude is considerably greater than a child that does not have that condition. And the high frequency it has a lower amplitude. So that's the theta beta ratio right there. Okay, let's take a case. <clears throat> the only thing I know about this kid is he's a 13-year-old male. He's not at all happy with being sitting in front of me. His mother dragged him in, <clears throat> and he's doing everything possible to act bored and disinterested. He's looking out the window, slouching in the chair, yawning, and so forth. <clears throat> These 99 numbers boil down to 25 or 30, depending upon <clears throat> uh, what's uh, relevant here. Now. This is the ADD form that I was talking about just a moment ago, the very pernicious form of it. <clears throat> this is the theta-beta ratio, eyes open, 
2.7, so we know he's got ADD. But look what happens on the challenge. This can be reading or, or uh, counting backwards or anything of that nature. It gets worse. Now, <clears throat> these are the kids <clears throat> who end up populating our prisons because the harder they try, the worse it gets. <clears throat> And it was George Fitzsimmons at University of Alberta who discovered this oh, 15 years ago, I guess now, where you can have a condition in which the brain looks okay at rest, that is with regard to the ADHD marker here, and it's only under cognitive challenge that you actually see the problem. So we have a situation here in which this child has made heroic efforts probably has been told that he's not trying and has concluded that he's just stupid. <clears throat> okay. Now there are a couple of other things in this uh, uh, record here. But you can imagine uh, what happens here when I talk to this child and say, you've got a particularly nasty form of ADD in which the harder you try, the worse it gets. <clears throat> I do a big build up to this, of course, and it's not unusual for the child to break down when I am uh, uh, analyzing this. And as they, uh, one kid said, in fact, I think it was this one, uh, that I was the, he felt I was the only guy on the planet who understood. And he's got in a couple of other things going on here uh, in which he has a lot of uh, alpha slowing and he has a lot of eyes closed uh, theta activity <clears throat> when he closes his eyes in the back of the brain. So I asked uh, his mother to leave, and let's call this kid Johnny, and, I, and after his mother left, I, uh, I said, Johnny, no, <clears throat> it's very important that you be a member of the team if we're going to help you here. I want you to stop smoking dope. Now, <clears throat> In Vancouver, I was going to be right 50% of the time anyway. But the fact of the matter is that's exactly what was happening. He was starting to experiment with it. <clears throat> and uh, he was a markedly impressed young lad when he knew that I could pick this up instantly. So if you're doing a full topo, <clears throat> this is what that condition looks like. You have elevated slow frequency all over the head. Now, this is a little eight-year-old girl that has that form of ADD in which under challenge it gets worse. Now this is very important for making sure that parents understand. Here's her theta-beta ratio at rest, but look what happens when we're doing treatment. Okay, It looks like the situation is getting a lot worse when in fact what's happening here is this is under challenge. She's trying very desperately to, uh, in the neurofeedback, to reduce the theta-beta ratio. That's the way it's set up for the thresholds. And look how long it took. It took her about 16 sessions before all of a sudden she gets it. Okay? And the brain starts to respond. If a parent had seen this and was under the impression and that uh, the uh, neurotherapy is making the situation worse, you would have had you would have lost the client. Okay. This is the letter from the mother, and one thing I wanted to point out here <coughs> is after uh, she went to a new school uh, after we had completed treatment, and had the mother's reporting on after uh, one week of school, she'd only been there one week, uh, the little girl brought her violin into class to play a solo for her new classmates and wasn't nervous about it. Last year at this time, that would have been possible. When you fix the ADD, you fix something far more important than that self-concept and self-esteem. Self That's what's going on here. <clears throat> High frontal alpha form of ADD is another very pernicious form. <clears throat> uh, this gives rise to a situation of uh, problems with planning, organizing, sequencing, and following through on things. But the emotional side of it is emotional dysregulation. And you can see this violates the algorithm in the front of the brain 
theta should have the highest amplitude, alpha should have the second highest amplitude, and beta should have the lowest amplitude. Here you can see <coughs> you have a, a, uh, a peak here in the amplitude in alpha as opposed to theta. There's your alpha, high alpha, uh, frontal alpha uh, form of ADD. The uh, other characteristics is uh, sometimes the children are very chatty and very social. Uh, with this, and uh, a lot of females uh, were misdiagnosed uh, with this condition, and I see a lot of uh, women in their 40s and 50s who had this condition, wasn't diagnosed and wasn't treated, and their careers are in shambles <laughs> simply because of the severe dysregulation and emotional volatility, <clears throat> uh, emotional erraticism. <clears throat> uh, this is a condition you often see with people by, uh, diagnosed with bipolar disorder, high frontal alpha. Here's what it looks like on a topo. Now there's another condition in which the uh, ADD symptom is really a form of an, uh, uh, perseveration, thought process, perseveration, and this is associated with the anterior cingulate gyrus, and uh, sitting right in around in here, and <clears throat> excuse me, when that's hot, uh, what happens is the person gets something on their mind, it's hard to get it out, so there's a perseveration of thought processes, and here's a, a note from a mother <clears throat> describing what she what uh, was called ADD, which was really elevated uh, activity in anterior cingulate gyrus. And here's the way the child des describes it. He also described having ADD as almost being the same as having a song stuck in your head. You just can't think. Okay? So of course the kid wasn't able to you know, process and pay attention. He was on the same dis dimension <coughs> as uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Suspected bullying, we get an awful lot of kids coming in <clears throat> with the diagnosis of ADD, and it's really an emotional issue. And <clears throat> this is one of the uh, patterns that we see, a profile. Here we have a marker for trauma, that is exposure to severe emotional stressors. I'll go over that in detail in just a few moments. He has a mild, mild form of an attention problem. That's not the issue here. Here he's a marker for reactive depression, that's the Richardson one that I just talked about earlier, and a marker for emotional volatility. So this kid's a sitting duck for a bully. This is the kind of kid that if a bully comes over and poses him, yeah, yeah, he's going to break down and cry. <clears throat> so it turns out we were 100% correct that this kid was involved in a serious bullying situation, the bully that had threatened the child uh, and if he told his mother, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we got that cleared up and did a very minor uh, treatment on him for that slightly elevated theta-beta ratio. <coughs> Depression and anxiety. In the old days, with topos, this is what it looks like. Here you have elevated slow frequency over on the left prefrontal orbital cortex, meaning the right's more active than the left. There's your marker for depression and the marker for anxiety back here, elevated uh, fast frequency in the occipital region in the brain. So here are the patterns for depression, depression profiles. <coughs> Excuse me. The genetic form, at least I'm pretty sure it's genetic, is when beta is elevated in the right relative to the left. Now the, the, the uh, underlying principle associated, associated with depression is the right side of the brain is more active than the left. In a lot of ways that can happen. If beta is higher in the left relative to the right, if alpha is higher in the left relative to the right, the Davidson one, uh, that uh, <clears throat> again means that the right's more active than the left. If theta is more active 
in the left relative to the right, or if the theta beta ratio is more active in the left relative to the right. Now, trauma enters in, and we'll be discussing in just a few moments how you spot people who've been exposed to uh, traumatic uh, stress levels. <clears throat> uh, the other uh, condition that we often find misdiagnosed as depression <clears throat> uh, is anxiety-based depression. When individuals have severe anxiety conditions, their depression is really a feeling of hopelessness <clears throat> because they simply can't function. And that's often diagnosed as, di as depression, and <clears throat> uh, antidepressants are used unsuccessfully, of course. Okay, a lot of data coming out <clears throat> that uh, of the ineffectiveness of antidepressants or the reverse or the obverse, and that is you make the situation much more chronic and uh, lifelong <clears throat> if, uh, uh, treatment, uh, if the uh, treatment of depression is uh, using antidepressants. But in any event, in the short term, uh, this was a demonstration that cognitive behavior therapy and sertraline were about equally effective in the treatment of depression for a positive uh, uh, response rate. Combination was even more effective. Okay? <clears throat> if you go out a ways, that is 24 to 36 weeks, you can see that it doesn't make much difference. Cognitive behavioral therapy alone, sertraline alone, combined. But Poor long-term uh, uh, relief for anxiety uh, conditions uh, in uh, people treated, the long-term effectiveness of sertraline and cognitive behavior therapy, 50% relapse rate in six years. And that's, there's a lot of data coming out now that the relapse rate is extremely high. Uh, excuse me. Uh, and the... Uh, chronicity rate is very high when you use uh, uh, treatments based on medication. Neurotherapy, our hit rate appears to be a lot better. <clears throat> uh, the uh, industry relapse rate, as we've been saying here, in uh, uh, is uh, 65 to 70 percent. <clears throat> in the early work done by Penniston, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, his uh, two-year follow-up relapse rate was only 20%, and we have a lot of other data that have come out recently. Uh, in Journal of Neurotherapy, and, uh, about eight years ago, uh, we see response rates, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, 19%. And again, uh, in a homeless shelter, again, uh, the relapse rate is much, much, much lower. We have an outreach program and uh, dealing with the homeless, and the only problem we have with the treatment of the homeless <coughs> are the agencies. They become parasitic on the problem, so it's not the homeless that are the problem, it's the caregivers. Trauma. Very sobering statistic. Vandekult at <coughs> ISNR last year gave a keynote address, and he said roughly the same thing. Over 50% of children have been exposed to trauma levels of emotional stress. So anytime you have a child walk in the door, I don't care what the diagnosis is, <clears throat> uh, you're going to have a significant number of them that are, are being affected by trauma levels of emotional stress. <clears throat> okay, so this is what... <clears throat> a nice healthy waveform should look like. And remember we were talking about the algorithm that and, uh, amplitude is inversely related to frequency. So uh, if we're looking here, uh, the slower frequencies have the highest amplitude. And alpha form of ADD, as we indicated, you have a big bump at alpha, and so alpha is, is stronger than the uh, theta amplitude. 
at the alpha response. Now, the alpha response we measure at CZ and O1, <clears throat> and it is when alpha jumps when you close your eyes and shut off the visual cortex, and when you open the, your eyes, alpha amplitude should drop like a stone. And this is what the alpha response looks like. And so here's, again, a nice healthy looking <clears throat> uh, display. And when the eyes are closed, you'll see a big jump in the alpha frequency sitting right in here. There it goes. <clears throat> so there's your alpha response. Nice strong alpha response. And when the eyes are open, it should drop like a stone. And as you get older, the sluggishness of the uh, recovery. There you go. Okay, now what does trauma look like? This is trauma. Now you can see that the algorithm doesn't look as robust. <clears throat> and when the eyes are closed, you can see uh, that <clears throat> just not able to uh, uh, develop a nice strong alpha response. <clears throat> See, there it is there. And it's visually different. You can tell a healthy response just by looking at it in the spectral display. Now, what if the person has a strong resonant alpha, like an artist? Artists have very strong alpha. and. Uh, uh, in the back of the brain, a very strong alpha response. What happens when you have trauma in addition to that, the traumatized artist signature as we call it, and it has a very distinct pattern. And it looks like the alpha is trying to come up and can't quite stabilize. I think it's an interesting pattern. And when I describe this to uh, artists, I treat a lot of uh, artists with artist block. Uh, they say that's exactly what it feels like. It feels like somebody's sitting on my creativity. So there's the trauma, <coughs> traumatized artist signature. Now we did a study <coughs> to demonstrate this. And in a manner similar to what uh, Richie Davidson did for the uh, depression in the frontal cortex, we showed pictures to uh, clients around the alpha response. Now, <clears throat> if you have a person open and close their eyes, you'll get an alpha response. If you do it twice, the second alpha response is usually stronger than the first. There are a lot of reasons for that. And, you know, the person knows what you're doing, feels comfortable the second time around, whatever. So we showed the pictures in that interim. So we had them open and close their eyes. Then we had a 10-second break where we showed them, a 15-second break where we showed them a picture, either this one, a mildly positive picture of a farmer in the field with a horse, now, the reason this has been degraded to that degraded gray is so that it matched in quality what I'm going to show you next, which is a disturbing picture. And this is the one that we, the negative picture that we showed. And this is the data that we found. <clears throat> if you do no picture between the two open-closed uh, episodes of alpha response, you get a mild, mildly stronger one the second time around. A positive picture gives a much stronger and, uh, alpha response the second time, and this is what happens if you give the negative, if you show the negative picture, that is alpha blunting, and that's what the trauma marker is, alpha blunting. Here's where we measure it, uh, up over the centrimotor strip and in the occipital region in the brain. 
when you're doing trauma release, that is when uh, we're pushing up alpha, when you get a release of the alpha, very often you have an emotional reaction to it, and that is our trauma treatment, and you want to make sure that the person allows it to happen and try to potentiate it, and then you can do whatever other therapies you have in order to help the person process it, most efficient psychotherapy on the planet. <clears throat> now, here is the alpha, and you can see it's climbing because we're doing brain driving, which I'll describe in just a moment. And once the alpha starts to climb, and then we get a, an alpha, a uh, trauma release. You can see theta drops, the alpha drops, <clears throat> and here's the response right there. There's your trauma release. Okay. <clears throat> This is the Kelly family. Mrs. Kelly brought in her two children, seven-year-old Jane and a nine-year-old, I believe, Martin. So here's the assessment that I did. <clears throat> yeah, there's some, you know, mild ADD, but I have a trauma marker at both this location and this location. So red flags go up. What's going on? <clears throat> Remember and. The abuse could be the person who's sitting in the room with the child. Here's Martin. <clears throat> Again, you know, a mild ADD issue. Again, two trauma markers. So I, as you can imagine, this is a hot potato. How do you handle this? How do you not terrify the mother in terms of the discussion of this? How do you fish it out if the problem is a, a domestic problem and we see all kinds of possibilities here. Remember 50 percent of the kids walking in the door are going to have been exposed to trauma level stress. So when I broached this with uh, Mrs. Kelly she broke down and she said the problem is her husband who <coughs> is verbally extremely uh, abusive and he's uh, extremely uh, uh, volatile. So I said, let me measure your head. So I did another. Now, I'm doing all three of these, by the way, in an hour, three brain assessments. <clears throat> Mrs. Kelly, trauma marker, trauma marker, and severe depression marker. Okay, so the kids are at incredible risk here. Uh, they have the traumatic stress associated with the father's volatility, but the mother is not available to them emotionally because of the depression. And you know all of the data associated with a depressed mother or parent, but mother in particular. Okay, so fortunately Mr. Kelly was well aware of the problem. He had had this problem for years and he had been on every conceivable medic, uh, pharmaceutical cocktail. And he uh, had a trigger uh, 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 anger response, <clears throat> and he uh, admitted that he was very unpleasant to be around and very hostile. Mr. Kelly has trauma markers, which is not at all unusual, by the way, when they're the perpetrator. But Mr. Kelly has elevated alpha in the front. So Mr. Kelly has high frontal alpha ADD, which carries with it, in addition to other things, marked emotional dysregulation. Now he's got some other things going on too. <clears throat> but there's the basis of the emotional volatility that's causing trouble in the, pa in the uh, family. So the clinical cue helped us sort this out, that the treatment of the children's ADD, which was not ADD, of course, was to treat Mr. Kelly's ADD. That's the power of the clinical cue. Okay, brain driving. Brain driving... Uh, uh, Neurofeedback is instrumental conditioning, you know, Skinner and his rats. And 
uh, brain driving is classical conditioning, Pavlov and his dogs. So what we do here is we pair an unconditioned stimulus that has an effect on a particular brain activity and to condition to decrease or increase whatever it is we want to do a particular functioning in the brain. Now here, uh, this is the work of uh, Sadius in, uh, at McGill University in the 40s. What they're doing is pairing <coughs> light and sound. Now here's sound without any light and it doesn't have any effect on, on alpha. Uh, light is an unconditioned stimulus to blunt alpha, so alpha is reduced when you turn light on. So here they're pairing the sound with the light, just like Pavlov and his dogs. Uh, and here they have sound only, no light, and you can see they've conditioned the alpha response. And you can condition it uh, with uh, periodic time lapses, again, uh, here the light comes on and then it's off for a fixed period of time and after about 50 uh, sessions they turn on, <clears throat> they uh, don't turn on the light and they get the alpha blunting. So <clears throat> the brain follows the same rules uh, in classical conditioning and here's the setup that we use where we can stimulate acupuncture points, we can present sound, we can present light, and it's controllable by the, the client, that is the intensities. <clears throat> if you have a, a client that has severe panic disorder, for example, you don't want to just blast them with a light without <clears throat> you know, them being able to have a sense of control. These are the goggles that we use so that the lights can be around the periphery and you can turn them on and off based on the uh, uh, EEG. And here's a child developmentally delayed. <clears throat> this is his writing. And they're actually writing while we're doing the brain driving, tasking while doing the brain driving, which is extremely effective. And you can see what happens here. The, uh, the child's uh, writing becomes much, much better. Now, brain driving can be used in infants <clears throat> because it's non-volitional. And here's a situation of the West syndrome, which is pediatric seizure disorder, could be uh, fatal. <clears throat> These people flew in and spent three months with us. When they started, <clears throat> they had zero seizure-free days. And we went right after the sensory motor rhythm, <clears throat> you know, just like Barry Sturman. Uh, initial uh, work in which we're driving down the sensory motor rhythm, driving, I'm sorry, driving up the sensory motor rhythm, driving down theta using brain driving. And if you have a number of seizure-free days, and when they left us, the child was 100% seizure, seizure-free. And you can see that the theta SMR ratio came down substantially. It was over 10 at all of the sites previously. <clears throat> and this is a tearjerker. This is a child with genetic degenerative brain disorder. It is a terminal condition. Neurotherapy is not going to fix it. <clears throat> but what the parents wanted is to not follow the usual regimen of sedating the child, keeping the child asleep basically until he dies. And they wanted to have a relationship with the child. So we did the same thing. <clears throat> drive down the uh, theta, drive up the theta, uh, the SMR. They use a, a treatment, home treatment, emotional freedom technique that uh, helps with that. And what happened was the child was alert, many seizure-free days, regained partial use of the arms and died 16 months after treatment, exactly what the parents wanted. And there's yours truly with vibrating animals. Uh, the vibrating animals uh, are used as unconditioned stimuli to increase uh, slow frequency in the brain of kids. And, and here's the acupuncture points that are used. We have the electrical stimulation uh, of many acupuncture points. The one I'm showing you here is the heart meridian. There's yours truly getting sh uh, <clears throat> acupuncture training, jabbing needles into poor people. So brain driving using heart seven electrically will increase 
uh, alpha and slow frequency and have we use 10 Hertz lights to try to grab the increase so that you can try to entrain with 10 Hertz lights what you're pushing with the uh, heart and this is a 70 year old woman who had trauma exposure and sleep problems and uh, you can see the nice change in uh, uh, the uh, percent the, uh, the alpha response after treatment and during treatment you can see that the alpha increase was 148 percent uh, after you stop driving it then you get the uh, this is uh, double what it was prior to treatment <clears throat> and here's we're driving up to the theta beta ratio in the back of the brain again using these procedures and you can see the increase in theta beta ratio very profound using the classical conditioning procedure. Here's another one where we got a 60 percent increase. Now we can do physiotherapy with this procedure as well in which while the person is ambulating we're doing classical conditioning uh, brain activity using the brain driver procedure with wireless you know, technology. Uh, this is a fellow who uh, was in a coma for eight months. They thought he was going to die. When he lived, they said he would not be able to uh, take care of himself, any primary functions. Uh, here he's receiving the Courage to Come Back Award. <clears throat> and he was our client for <clears throat> quite some time. And uh, here he is. You know, he started off wheelchair, <clears throat> which was a feet, then he went to a walker, then he went to a four-point cane, and <clears throat> here he is ambulating down the street. He wants to get that uh, right, I'm sorry, left arm functioning, which is what we're working on. I, I can't play these for you because you can't do it in a webinar. I, I, technically, I can't, but this gives you the change in voice uh, of somebody. Uh, this is one of the sounds we use in brain driving <clears throat> and this is designed to suppress theta amplitude and you can see these are uh, uh, female college students without any, uh, uh, they're not clinical students, uh, clinical uh, clients, adult ADD, child ADD and closed head injury and the suppression of uh, theta that we get with that harmonic, it's called omni, <clears throat> excuse me, is anywhere from about 12 percent up to about 30 percent on average. Uh, this is uh, the data from the late Dr. Budzinski using my omni and the reason I'm showing you this is one of the problems we have with people that get to be my age is slowing of alpha, it's an age-related decline but the omniharmonic drives up the faster alpha and suppresses some of the lower stuff. <clears throat> and it can be used in safe rooms. <clears throat> this is from Mary Jo Sabo quite some number of years ago. And what she did, this was a school for troubled kids. She set up a room where the child could, uh, was disruptive, he left the classroom, went down and listened to Omni in this case and when he gained control he could go back to the classroom so he's, she's teaching self-regulation. They did this in Kansas City at TLC, a treatment, a, a school for very seriously disturbed kids and they used Serene. kid went into the uh, safe room and the time in the uh, safe room before using Serene was about 11 minutes and now it's about 8 minutes and there was a reduction in the number of visits uh, to the safe room. Again, they're teaching self-regulation. It's not punishment, they're teaching. So the um, talk that I just gave is based largely on my uh, book, Adding Neurotherapy to Your Practice, and some of the things in t associated with uh, the ADD come from this book, when the ADH diagnosis is wrong, and it is a many, many, many times. It just came out with Prager. And that's my earlier book from Rutgers University Press. And thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation to speak. Okay, Paul, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, lots of great ideas in here. And uh, 
Uh, we appreciate uh, hearing them uh, and some really innovative stuff. Uh, so if anybody is interested, you can contact Paul quite easily um, through his website. You can email him. And if they want to contact you, Paul, what email should they use? Excuse me. My name, P. Swingle at swingleclinic.com. Okay. And if you want the uh, uh, the handout with all of the uh, probes and so forth, send it to office manager at swingleclinic.com, and he'll fire off a copy for you. Okay, terrific. Well, I bet everybody has lots of questions, and we're out of time, unfortunately. We'd love to uh, uh, get some question fielded, so maybe we can have you back some other time and uh, have a, 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 a bit of a question and answer period, too, so people can uh, ask you some questions. I'm sure there'll be lots of discussion in the next Lunch and Learn afterwards uh, uh, later in the week about this, so uh, uh, hopefully we can hear some more about it. Okay, anytime. All right, thank you very much, and have a, a, a great week, everybody, and we'll get together on Friday, and maybe we can chat this up and uh, even come up with some questions for Paul. Thank you very much.